Okay, so just a few things about the epistemology of the closet. I think she does a really amazing job of breaking down the distinction between sex and gender. Um, and I, I said something about this last time in the video of Judith Butler, where I discussed Judith Butler, but here she really explains it nicely. So go make sure that you've understood that and looked at that. Um, she gives us an understanding of sex that is equated with chromosomes, and then therefore the kind of concomitant normative um, biological, physiological things that emerge from those chromosomes. So reproductive capacity for someone with, um, you know, XX chromosomes, um, you know, genitals that look a certain way. Again, normative, right? Um, so kind of generally speaking, if you have these chromosomes, your body will form this way. If you have these chromosomes, your body will form the other way. Um, she says that that is a definition of sex. Gender is the cultural system that shapes all the attributes you know, that are kind of superficially attached to the sex that is assigned. And so she, she breaks this down and cites Gail Rubin's idea of the sex gender system um, in a really effective and I think helpful way for us. But she also moves beyond it. Uh, and so that's important for us to note. In some ways she says that feminists have erred because they have, um, well, for a couple of reasons, they have given sex, um, or they have fixed sex kind of too specifically. They want to emphasize the cultural contingency of gender. And in doing so, they have said, okay, we'll, we'll grant that sex, biological sex is somehow really fixed. You know, that's the given. So maybe they've gone too far to set up that dichotomy, that binary in between sex and gender. Um, the other way that they've erred, she says, is that they've often actually <laughs> almost, um, paradoxically conflated sex and gender. So we often speak of you know, um, same sex desire when really shouldn't it be same gender desire? You know, why do we use this word sex when we mean gender and why do we use gender if we mean sex and vice versa? So she's really kind of critiquing the way that those like that language has become kind of um, problematically conflated, let's say. In order for us to have a theory that will emerge as queer theory, but in this moment has not yet you know, fully been developed, but a theory of sexuality. She says, with this, we need to separate this from studies of gender. And it's not because she thinks that gender has nothing to do with sexuality. I mean, as she says, you know, you can't have a concept of homosexuality without a concept of gender. I mean, gender is what um, defines what makes something you know, homosexual or heterosexual but that the same kind of lens or approach that we understand gender through is not going to help us fully understand sexuality, in part because it's going to narrow the debate around sexuality to be about you know, gender, and sexuality should be something much broader than gender. So you know, she wants to create space for theories around sexual object choice or sexual orientation that are not about whether one is attracted to men or women or, you know, whatever, you know, it's kind of gender in between, that we could think of sexuality beyond that, beyond gender in terms of a kind of series of desires, um, desires in the sense of, you know, structural sense that she just defines in the previous text, I think it's helpful to keep in mind. Uh, on page 2430, or 2473, sorry, she really kind of defines this in an interesting way. Um, at the bottom, she says, the definitional narrowing down in this century of sexuality as a whole to a binarized calculus of homo or heterosexuality is a weighty fact, but an entirely historical one. To use that fait accompli as a reason for analytically conflating sexuality per se with gender would obscure the degree to which the fact itself requires explanation. And, and then she's going to go on to give us kind of a series of ways that we can think about sexuality beyond gender. So take a look pretty carefully at 2475, you know, where she starts to um, make sure that's the page I wanted. Sorry, 2473 actually is what I meant shortly before the quote that I read, where she says that we can think of sexually not only between genders, but between, well, you know, um, she gives a whole series of things. 
Many other dimensions of sexual choice, auto or allerotic, within or between generations, species, etc. And then she goes on to some other examples. So I mean, we might say, oh, species, and kind of pull back a bit. But um, this idea that sexuality can be much broader than question of homosexuality or heterosexuality is really kind of the main point here. Let's see, I think um, I think that's where I'd like to end it, but I do want to say one more thing about the purpose or the kind of relationship to literary analysis that she drops in here on 2476 and 2475. Um, she she reminds us that feminist theory has been really effective in understanding literary texts um, from a feminist perspective that do not only look at female characters, but look at the way certain things are, quote, gendered. So, for example, on 2475, she says in that bottom paragraph, through a series of developments structured by the deconstructive understandings and procedures sketched above, we have now learned as feminist readers that dichotomies in a given text of culture, as opposed to nature, public as opposed to private, mind as opposed to body, activity as opposed to passivity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are under particular pressures of culture and history, likely places to look for implicit allegories of the relations of men and women. So we can see these dichotomies, these binaries, culture, nature, and um, you know, passivity, activity, mind, body. We can see the ways that these are coded as masculine or feminine. Women are associated with nature, men are associated with civilization, society, and culture. Um, you know, women are deemed passive, men are deemed active men are of the mind, women are of the body or of the emotions. So these, these things, these kind of affects or even um, inanimate objects, you know, can be both gendered in some way. And this comes through in cultural objects and literature. And as cultural critics and literary scholars, we can kind of see the gendering of certain affects or certain objects or relations and kind of analyze them as feminist theorists, even if what we're analyzing isn't specifically a female character, let's say, okay? So this process, this deconstructive feminism, which has been hugely influential in literary analysis, Sedgwick says something like this can happen for what will eventually become queer theory for queer studies. So we could see the way that sexual orientation or the kind of the binary between heterosexual and homosexual is reproduced in literary texts and cultural objects, even that purport to have nothing to do with sexuality as such, um, but that might uh, kind of assume this strict heterosexist binary in some way. And this is why the texts uh, in theory that kind of come after Sedgwick or come after these texts of hers from the early 90s and the 80s um, are going to be interested in this idea of queering. You know, to queer something, to perform a queer reading is not only to understand the relationships between characters in a certain way, a la Barbara Smith, but to um, to start to deconstruct the binary of heterosexism that shapes not only the relationships between characters, but also the structure of the text overall, so that there can be much more fluidity and um, much more space, you know, liberating space for desire and pleasure. Okay, I realize this, these are some really difficult texts, and certainly the way that she writes can be really challenging with these long sentences. So I hope this has been helpful in breaking it down a little bit for you, and I'll look forward to reading your comments and questions on the discussion board.